I'm different. Um, I haven't talked about this, but I dress differently than most of you. And uh, I've never explained it to you. Um, I dress up when I go to weddings and funerals. How many of you do? Okay, well, Sunday I am celebrating a funeral and a wedding every Sunday. The old man is dead, and I'm uh, married to Jesus Christ. So I dress up every Sunday to celebrate my death and my marriage to Jesus Christ. Now, uh, I have a new tie today. I usually don't buy ties. They're usually gifts. But I was shopping with my wife, and I found this tie with a matching hanky and couplings and a tie tack for 49 cents. <laughs> now, I, I, at, at, at Ross, and I'm telling you that just to get, so you get to know me a little bit. I'm being myself a little bit. I'm called a cheapskate by my friend, but I'm very frugal. I'm very frugal. In fact, I grew up in the, in the 50s. And uh, those of you who grew up in the 50s uh, or were alive in the 50s, you'll remember uh, the Cold War that we were in. Now, growing up in Montana, we even had bomb shelters. Uh, the rich doctor across the alley, when we'd hit our wiffle ball into his yard, we would see his, uh, what are those called again? Bomb shelter. Uh, and Nikita Khrushchev was the dictator, and I remember him pounding his shoe. That was in the weekly reader in school. And uh, the big news was we were afraid of the Russians and their propaganda and that they like to brainwash you. Uh, propaganda was a communication technique that the uh, Russians used to uh, disseminate information that would promote a certain agenda and put down another agenda. Uh, it was brainwashing or propaganda. Now, you know, things really haven't changed all that much, have they? <laughs> Today they call it fake news. This isn't anything new. And you know, this battle between truth and lies goes way back to the Garden of Eden. The ultimate war is between the God of truth and the Satan of lies. And you and I are in the middle. This is what is happening in the church that we're going to look at today in Revelation chapter 2. We're continuing our series entitled, Dear Church. This letter is to the third church in this list called Pergamum. Some Bibles say Pergamos, but we're sticking with Pergamum today. This church was infected with false teaching, and today we're going to focus on how Jesus wants to help us discern the truth so that our church today is not compromised by lies. And Kate said she'd buy me dinner if I said this term. Hashtag face new, fake news, as if I know what that means. <clears throat> She's not here today to hear it. You'll find the text in your chair Bible, page 862. Uh, that, that Bible is yours to keep if you need one, and some of you take them and give them away, so feel free to use it as a witnessing tool to give to people. So we're reading from Revelation chapter 2, beginning at verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lived. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, 
Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Would you pause and let me pray. Father, we need your help to study your word. Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit. Help this preacher to communicate your truth correctly and help each one here hear what the Holy Spirit wants them to hear today. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Now there's a map that we'd like to show you to remind you of the part of the world that we're looking at. Uh, these churches are in what is called Turkey now, Asia Minor then, and Paul the Apostle did his missionary journeys through this part of the world. What I want to point out to you today is, see that little dot that says Patmos? That's the island that John, who's writing these words, was in exile on that island when he was writing those. And you kinda, I kind of wonder, I haven't been to that part of the world, but whether or not he could see from the island and, and, and to see the mainland. But we're in uh, the city up there, number three, uh, Pergamum. And these are real people, real times. And today, as we look at this third church, we're going to look at three characters in the battle for truth today. Jesus, Satan, Satan. And you and me. Jesus, we're going to see, is the revealer of truth. And Satan is the distorter of truth. And you and I are the audience who are listening. Dear church, who are you listening to? Which one are you listening to? Are you listening to the revealer of truth or the distorter of truth? Today we want to listen to Jesus. So Jesus, as we look at this text, describes himself as the one who has the sharp, two-edged sword. You know, uh, I always think of a snake, a serpent that has that little forked tongue. Well, that's the enemy. He speaks with forked tongue. But Jesus is the sharp, two-edged sword. And elsewhere in the Bible, uh, in the book of Hebrew, describes uh, the, the word of God as a sharp two-edged sword in Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of our soul and our spirit. Joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and intents of the heart. John, the, the, the man, the, the only apostle who lived to an old age, the rest were martyred, is writing these words at the end of his life under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as he's on that island. He also wrote the Gospel of John. And in the Gospel of John, he describes, as he begins that book, that Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. Jesus was there at creation. He is the Word of God. Uh, Jesus, who was there at creation... When the world was spoken into existence, he knows everything. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows everything about everything. You know, sometimes I stop and think, and how does that make you feel? That Jesus knows everything about you. He knows every thought, every feeling. I trust it makes you feel secure. That the God who created you knows all about it. Sometimes it may be scary because... Oh, he knows my every thoughts. Well, let's just face it. You can't hide anything from God. <laughs> Adam and Eve tried to hide behind a bush, but you can't hide behind from God. He knows everything. You can only lie to yourself and to other people. Jesus tells this church in Pergamum that he knows that they are remaining true. He gives them commendation. They have not renounced their faith. They are standing firm. Jesus knows where you're standing. Are you standing firm for the truth in your community? Jesus is saying he's proud of this church. Now, um, 
sometimes um, we believe lies. We believe lies about ourselves. Satan is the distorter of truth. And sometimes we have these feelings that we're no good, that we can't do anything right. We have these self-condemning thoughts, and they really are coming from the enemy. And I believe Jesus wants to compliment you. He doesn't want to condemn you. He didn't come to condemn. He came to compliment. You know, when I was a kid growing up in Montana, we used to go fly fishing in the Big Hole River. And some of you fly fishermen may, may drool. Well, you know, I didn't catch very many fish as a kid. And as a kid, I used to have feel that, oh, I must have sin in my life. That's why I'm not catching fish. And I used to repent. Oh, God, what do I need to repent of? Well, that was a lie. The truth is I just wasn't a good fisherman. <laughs> you know, uh, that's funny. But, you know, a lot of times those thoughts you're having about yourself, they're lies from the enemy. God knows you. He loves you. You're valuable to him. I wonder what Jesus is proud about in your life. Now, we don't want to be lifted up in pride, but it seems that Jesus wants to compliment his kids when they do well. Do you ever ask yourself, what does Jesus think of me? I think it would be a good thing for you to do once in a while in your prayer life. Lord, what are your thoughts towards me today? Be quiet and listen. You know, if this is something new to you in your relationship, Prayer is, is a relationship, talking to God. And it's a wonderful thing to hear his still, small voice just speak to your heart that he loves you, he's proud of you, and he's caring for you. And that's what Jesus is doing to the people here in this city, and he wants to commend you as well. Uh, in John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32, Jesus says, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus is the revealer of truth. He knows all about you. He loves you more than you can comprehend. And he wants you to be encouraged that he's on your side and he's proud of you. Trust Jesus to help you to discern the truth. You know, I think we can learn another little lesson from how Jesus treats people to how we should treat people. If Jesus commends and compliments people, I think we should do the same. Uh, sometimes we are so quick to criticize people, to condemn, and to complain. And from my study of the Bible, two of the things that tick God off more than anything else is people who are always complaining and always criticizing. And, uh, you know, I would just like to encourage us as brothers and sisters in the family of God that we look for opportunities to encourage one another by complimenting each other. Uh, you know, as citizens in our community, we often speak ill of our leaders. It doesn't really help. You know, the Bible tells us to pray for our leaders. There's a lot of bad talk going on in our nation, and we need to pray and we need to look for ways that we can encourage and build up our community. When I begin to think badly about others, the Holy Spirit reminds me that they need your prayers. They don't need your criticism. They need your prayers. You know, if you're a parent, you need to catch your kids doing something good once in a while. As a parent, if the only time you talk to your kids is when you're chewing them out, that, that's that's usually going to backfire. And this is what you find about God. God always compliments us before he tells us what we're doing wrong. <laughs> so let's practice that in our lives with one another. Amen? Because Jesus is the revealer of truth. He helps us to, to discern that truth about ourselves as well as about others in life. As well as telling this church in Pergamon that he knows their good works, he tells them that he knows where they dwell. He knows where they're living. And he makes some interesting terms about this place in which they live. He says, Satan has his throne here. Now, that sounds quite powerful. 
It, uh, why is that? It may be because Pergamum was the oldest city in, in this part in Turkey, and it was the provincial Roman capital for Asia. It was also the first city to build temples to Caesar Augusta, which Pastor Jason has talked about, that worship, to Zeus, and also to the serpent god Asclepius. The conical, there was a conical hill be, be, behind the city that housed these temples, and it would have appeared to look like a throne. The Apostle Paul, again, who was writing these words, he wrote in his gospel in John 8.44, that Satan is a liar and the father of lies. And so this would be the throne of lying, of deception and and truth. Satan is that distorter of truth. Jesus, as the one who has the powerful sword, he's revealing truth. Satan is the one who's trying to distort that truth. Now, Satan is just one fallen angel who led a rebellion against God before man came on the scene. And he can only be in one place at one time, but he has a following of of rebellious angels that we call demons or evil spirits. They work behind the scenes in the unseen world to confuse and deceive people. They work really hard, especially with leaders in politics, and religion. <laughs> and you know, those are the two subjects are the most dangerous subjects to talk about. I was told as a boy, you know, you, you get into trouble, you talk about politics and religion. The church in Pergamon was being influenced by this distorter of the truth. And the main charge that Jesus brings against them is that they were tolerating the false teaching of Balaam and Balak. Now, you'd have to look in Numbers 22 to 24 to find that Balaam was the religious leader and Balak was the political leader. And Balak, the political leader, had hired Balaam, the prophet, to uh, prophesy against Israel. Uh, he offered them him big money, and they were working together to deceive God's people in the Old Testament. And that is something that was going on here, this deception through this teaching in the church. They used food offered to idols and sexual immorality to distort the truth. The Nicolaitans, who also distorted the truth about sexuality, were also operating in this church. Now, if you uh, look at the facts of life, I'm told the two strongest drives we have are for food and for sex. That's f- strong, uh, that drive for food is so strong because if you don't eat, you don't live as a person. The drive for sex is so strong because if we, uh, if we don't propagate, we won't continue our heritage. The, the, the challenging thing is, is that the distorter of truth works on those two desires for food and sex to get us to abuse those, to misuse them, and to hurt and destroy ourselves. Uh, We need to trust Jesus to help us discipline these two drives, our drive for food and our drive for sex. The Apostle Paul, he wrote to the church in Corinth, Greece, these words found in 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, I know I'm speaking as an old man. But our culture is pretty messed up when it comes to sexuality. Satan is telling a lot of lies about this important part of life. He says pornography doesn't hurt anybody. Living together before marriage is is good practice to make sure we're meant to be together. After all, a marriage license is just a piece of paper. The distortive truth tells us that we deserve instant gratification. You don't have to wait for marriage. Sexting isn't real. It's only virtual. 
I guess we could call that hashtag fake news. <laughs> well, the fact is, overeating is, is, one of, is a major health issue, and the misuse of sex is a major health and social issue in our culture today. And God's way is still the best way, one man and one woman for life. I, for the sake of, I, I, there's, I just really prayed about this, but I, I got to tell you a story. I, I've been wanting to tell this story for a long time, but I have a friend who literally I get together every once in a while. He told me, he gave, and I wasn't asking him, he says, this is a story you need to tell. Uh, as a young man, I, I coached uh, basketball, little leagues, and uh, Interesting, my, co my son now who I coach, he's the high school basketball coach for Linwood girls. They went to state, but they lost last night. <laughs> anyway, to try to make a long story short, I met this gentleman coaching Little League basketball, and we worked together coaching our sons. It turns out he had grown up in Assembly of God Church in Lewiston, Idaho area, went away to the service, uh, stopped following Jesus, uh, married uh, a Dutch woman who is an atheist, uh, but he wasn't a practicing Christian, and uh, he committed sex outside of marriage. It came back to bite him. Just a few years ago, he gets a call from somebody who was searching their father, and it's a, it's a girl that he gave birth to and didn't know. When that news becomes public, his wife, who's still an, an atheist, she doesn't want to have anything to do with him. They've been married for many years. They're still together. I've kind of counseled them. I've worked with them. But one little moment of gratification has really messed up his life in his old age. And I just tell you that as one example. There's so many examples how you, uh, how you mess up life if you don't follow God's way of doing things. God knows best. Well, what are we going to do? Certainly, we're not going to compromise our teaching to accommodate the culture, are we? Uh, I've strayed from the script, so uh, we'll just jump. Uh, if you're going to be true to Jesus, you must not only live by the truth, but you need to love people like Jesus loved them. Although we do not agree with the sexual confusion in the culture, Jesus was a friend of sinners, including sexually immoral people. You should be friends with them. But he was along with gluttons and gossips as well. He didn't compromise the truth. He accepted and respected people as they were, but he led them to the truth. He lived it. In the gospel, John recorded another powerful statement that Jesus made. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, as the revealer of truth, is also the truth. Now, for Jesus to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, is a very uh, absolute term. It stands in opposition to the theory that all roads lead to God. And it doesn't matter what you believe just as long as you're sincere. If you agree with Jesus and if you're a follower of Jesus, you will probably be, be called intolerant. But friends, we cannot accommodate every belief as truth, and we can't please everybody. Jesus is the revealer of the truth, and Satan is the distorter of truth. There's definitely a battle raging in our culture today as it was here in this city. How are you and I doing in the battle? You and I are the deciding factor in who will win the battle of truth. How will we let Jesus help us discern the truth? Well, it's really very simple. We just need to listen to him. <laughs> just listen to Jesus. Jesus entrusted us with the power to choose. He doesn't make anybody believe in him. And he didn't make this church uh, turn around, but he challenged him, repent. He said repent, and repent means to change change the way you're going. He challenged them to, to, to rethink what they were believing. 
uh, are you following Jesus? Are you believing the truth? Or are you believing the lies of the culture? Jesus urged this church to repent, which means rethink what you're believing. Are you believing the truth? Or are you deceived by a lie? How do, Jesus also tells this church to listen to the, to the Spirit of God. Now, the Bible is God's written record of truth, and so in order to listen to God, we need to read this book. Um, there's a prevalent uh, attitude in our culture. One of the most prevailing attitudes in our culture is that truth is relative, that there is no absolute but man, if you just stop and think about it, does that make sense that truth is relative? Life would be chaos if truth was relative. Uh, everybody would do what's right in their own eyes. And I think that's what's going on in a culture who says there is no absolutes. So friends, there, the Bible is our record written down from God. Have you accepted the Bible as the guide for your life. Are you following it? You know, there was a man once who set out to say, I, I don't think this is true. And he's, several have set out, but one in our culture set out to disprove this Bible as being authentic. And he ended up writing a book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, because he found this book to be the most reliable printed work on the planet. And he became a follower of Jesus Christ. If you have not begun to follow Jesus Christ, and you haven't read the Bible, I challenge you to start to read the Bible. Pastor Jason has given the challenge of this Lenten season to read through the Gospels. And there's an app that uh, I can't help you with that <laughs> you can find, but he can help you. I just go by the book. <laughs> The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If, if you are, are not reading the Bible, I have a simple plan. From my childhood, my father taught me to read Psalms and Proverbs every day. And I still do to this life. In fact, Billy Graham helped me to do it systematically. This is what I learned from Billy Graham. And I practice this. If you read five Psalms a day and one chapter of Proverbs, you read it through every month. And, the, and that's what I practice. And the way I do psalms is, like today is 25. I read the 25th and 55th. And later in the day, I'll read 85. And then the last thing before I go to bed, I'll do 115 and 145. And see, uh, for me, whatever I'm reading, I'm always doing that because the psalms is my prayer and praise. It's my relationship with God. And Proverbs is the wisdom book that helps me in my relationship with people. I have another little tool. Uh, if you need help getting into God's word, to the classes that, that I lead, I have a little daily devotional that does have a reading through the Bible guide, and it has a daily little inspiration that is inspiring. And if you'd like one of those, I have some right over here. I can get you after the service. If you're a, following, a follower of Jesus, my question is, are you studying the Bible regularly. If you are not, you are making yourself vulnerable to be brainwashed by society because you're hearing all kinds of stuff all the time. You need to brainwash yourself with this truth <laughs> instead of the truth of culture. So uh, Jesus not only helps us with the word, but he helps us in our prayer life. Uh, prayer is simply having that conversation with God. Jesus is always praying for you in heaven at the right hand of the throne of God, and the Holy Spirit has been given to help us pray here on earth. John, who's writing these words in his gospel, also said the Holy Spirit is our counselor. If you need questions answered, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. And sometimes you need to ask another friend to pray with you. As we pray together, we help each other uh, discern what God's truth is in a situation. If you're struggling with an issue, ask a godly uh, man if you're a man, a godly woman if you're a woman, to, 
to pray with you and counsel with you if you're wrestling with an issue. If you fail to repent and listen to the truth of Jesus, you will eventually reap the consequences of lies. You'll come to a dead end. You'll suffer the consequences. But if you discern the truth of Jesus and direct your course, you will certainly enjoy the fruits of a life lived with Jesus. To conclude this, uh, this letter, he promises them if they will repent, if they will follow the truth, they'll be given two rewards, hidden manna and a white stone. Uh, hidden manna refers to God's word. If you follow Jesus, you're going to know the truth. And that's our memory verse for, for today, John 8, 32. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, in, in the culture of the day, as we're wrapping up the Olympics, uh, it was common uh, in, uh, in games that you got a white stone for your reward. They get a gold medal these days, and we, I'm so happy for you, Pastor Jason, that the curling team got the gold. Yeah. Yeah. But did you hear that they were given the wrong medal, <laughs> and they had to correct it? So a white stone symbolizes uh, a reward. Also in the judicial system, a judge had a black and a white stone, and if you were guilty, you got a black stone. If you were guilty, uh, innocent, you're given a white stone. And friends, this is the gospel. Jesus has already died for your sins. And he wants to make you pure and clean. He wants you to confess your sins and to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you'll take your Discover card, our, our, our next steps are, if you are not following Jesus, I challenge you, he's the one who knows the way to go, the right way to go. And we urge you to choose Jesus today. As, and if you would mark that, we would love to help you in your journey with, with, with prayer and counsel and reading material, study. So become a follower of Jesus. This is the best day. If you are following Jesus, the second question I ask you and follow up is, what lies might you believe, be believing? Is the truth been distorted in your life? And that's a worth, worthy prayer. Lord, I, I, am I believing a lie about myself, about other people, about uh, life? Am I believing a lie? Is it, has, has there been an enemy plant from the distorter of truth? And another practical application of next steps is, where do I need to apply God's truth? in my life. And number one, if you're not reading God's word on a regular basis, that needs to become a number one habit. And if you're not talking with God, you can't have a relationship. So talk to God. And then we want you to memorize John 8, 32. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you are showing us the way, the truth. Thank you, Jesus, that you have not left us in a confusing world where there is no absolutes. Thank you that you are the way and that you want to reveal the truth to us. And I pray, Lord, today that, any, that all of us today will be walking in the truth and will be living in the truth. And thank you, Lord, today that you have given us your written word and you've given your Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide us each step of the way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.